Are you worried about Congress playing politics with the raising of the debt ceiling? What would this do to Berkshire Hathaway stock and to the overall economy? You mean if they didn't raise it? If the, they didn't raise yeah, it. Yeah, right. well, it, it would probably uh, be the most asinine, you know, act that Congress, which uh, ever performed. That one time in Indiana, back in the 1890s, I think they passed a bill. I know it was introduced. Uh, you can look it up on a search engine. Uh, they passed a bill to change the value of pi, the mathematical term pi, to an even three, <laughs> because they said it would be easier for the school children to work with. Well. <laughs> That's the only bill I can think of that would give competition <laughs> to a refusal to raise the debt ceiling. I mean, it, it, it's extraordinary. I mean, it really is extraordinary that with our deficit running, you know, well over $100 billion a month uh, and all kinds of items that can be changed. I mean, there's having a debt ceiling to start with is, is a mistake. I mean, it doesn't, the United States of, of 2011 has a different debt capacity than the, the United States of 1911. And it, we're always, it's gonna be a growing country and we're gonna have a growing debt capacity. That doesn't mean I think it's a great idea at all to have debt growing as a percentage of GDP, but to stick debt ceilings on so that these games get played and all the time that gets wasted and everything. And, and, and the, you know, the amount of, number of silly statements that you hear and it just it just seems such a waste of time for a country that's got a lot of things to do um, but in the end they won't in my view there's no chance that they uh, don't increase the debt ceiling and I would love to see them you know like well I'd love to see them eliminate the idea because it just it results in these periodic uh, kind of stalemate operations where everybody uses it for posturing purposes and everything of the sort. But uh, it, the United States is not going to have a debt crisis uh, of any kind as long as we keep issuing our notes in our own currency. You know, the, uh, the difference between being able to borrow in your own currency and having to borrow in another currency is night and day. The only thing we have to worry about is the printing press and inflation. And if you're a member of the Euro, European Monetary Union, you have to worry about, you can't print money. You can, uh, you can go and get your coal members to try and help you out. But giving up the right to issue debt in your own currency is a huge step. And the United States has not done it. I don't know whether we've ever issued U.S. bonds in any other currency, but we certainly haven't made a habit of it. And the Japanese, incidentally, which have a very high ratio of debt to GDP, also have consistently borrowed in their own currency. And uh, believe me, when it's time to pay somebody back and you have a choice of paying and, and you're forced to pay in somebody else's currency, uh, versus paying in your in your own, uh, it's it's an uh, entirely different proposition. Matter of fact, Charlie and I we, we were trying to buy that bank back in Chicago. Yeah, in Chicago in the late 1960s, and this was a time of really tight money. And tight money was different then than tight money is today. I mean, that it, that it, it, uh, tight money meant no money, and somebody we wanted to buy this bank and. They wanted, uh, the only place we could find some money, I think was in Kuwait and Dinars, wasn't it? Kuwait and Dinars. Yeah, and I thought to myself, and Charlie concurred, you know, who the hell knew what they were gonna say the value of the dinar was when we went to pay it back? <laughs> I mean, it was not something over which we had a lot of control. So we decided not to borrow the money in dinars, though, even though I kind of wish we'd bought the bank. But, um, Charlie, have you got anything to say on that? Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> I do think, I do think, you know, I remember an era when we had a bipartisan foreign policy and all that, and I liked that era. And that was the Marshall Plan and a lot of wonderful 
constructive things were done. And uh, they were generous things. Now, now it seems to me that both parties are trying to compete to see who can be the most stupid. <laughs> and they keep topping one another. No. <laughs> You can tell Charlie is a fellow who's always fi filed an accurate income tax form. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not worried. Number seven. Hundred years from now, Warren and Charlie, what would each of you like to be remembered for? Old age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard Warren say that what he once said at his funeral is that's the oldest looking corpse I ever saw. <laughs> I have a different saying that came down from one of my great grandfathers, and I think it, he wanted to be remembered for a fortune fairly won and wisely used. That's a pretty good system. Yeah, I would, if, if you really ask me, I, I probably like teacher. I enjoy teaching a lot. And, uh, and some people think I do a little too much of the didactic stuff, but I. I like students coming, and, and uh, you know, I benefited by some fa and, and uh, you know, I benefited by some fabulous teachers, starting with my dad, but going on to Ben Graham, going on to Tom Murphy. I mean, there are lots of lots of great teachers. So I, I would say that uh, I might point out that that uh, on Will Chamberlain's gravestone, I think it says, "At last, I sleep alone." Which. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. well, we have some people from Kansas here, anyway. <laughs> okay, Becky. Um, Charlie, I got several variations of this question, uh, but this one comes from Peter Kerr in Waterloo, Canada. He says, could you please let us know a couple of the most important things you learned during the last year? I'll let Charlie go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to admit this because I've ignored high tech all my life, but I actually read that book in the Plex about Google, and I found it a very interesting book. And, and so here I am at my advanced age, and, and I find it interesting the way people have created these engineering cultures, which are quite peculiar and different from most of what we have at Berkshire. And, uh, Will I ever make any use of this? I, I doubt it. But I certainly enjoyed learning it. And if I enjoy learning it, I regard it as important because I think that's what you're here for, is to go to bed every night a little wiser than you were when you got up. I'm just trying to hold my own, actually. <laughs> no, what I, what I learned in the last year is, I, is that I'm going to have Charlie write the next press release. <laughs> Warren, I approved that damn press release with no objections. <laughs> the Berkshire shareholders are going to be in terrible trouble if they're relying on me to fix your errors. <laughs> okay, let's go to number 11. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Buffett, hope you enjoyed your first trip to India. I sure here's did. My, here's my question. One of the most important things that drive people are incentives. But if you live in a rich society, it's very hard to get your kids to work hard and reach their full potential because they just don't need to. So if, you're, if you or Charlie decide to have a kid in the next five years... <laughs> it will take be a star in the East. <laughs> it will take more than a decision. <laughs> How would you incentivize him or her? I thought, you were, gonna, I thought you were gonna say, how would you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good question. I apologize for interrupting. How, how would you incentivize him or her to compete against the hungry and highly motivated kids from emerging markets like China, Brazil, Russia, or India? Yeah, yeah I... I think certainly that if you are very rich and you 
bring up your kids to think that they are, they are more important in society or that they have some special privilege simply because they came out of the right womb, that, you know, that's just a terrible mistake. But Charlie has raised eight children that uh, I know quite well, most of them, and I don't think any of them have that sense. But it's, if, if you really are going to raise your kids to think that uh, other people should do all the work for them and that uh, they will be entitled to sit around and fan themselves for the rest of their lives, I mean, uh, you know, you will probably not get a good result. I, you know, in my, Charlie has been rich most, most of the, the uh, time when his kids, many of his kids were growing up, some of his kids were growing up. I've been rich while my kids were getting, certainly when they got into high school and, and college. But, but I, don't, I don't think, I certainly didn't want to give them the idea that they were special just because their parents were rich. And, and uh, uh, I don't think it, I don't think you necessarily have to get a bad result or have children that don't have any incentives um, simply because their parents are rich. The one thing I don't think you want to give them an incentive to do is try and outdo their parents at what their parents happen to be good at. I don't think that makes sense whether you're a professional athlete or a rich person or whatever it may be, a great novelist or you, know, you name it. But. Uh, uh, I, th I really think if, if you're rich and your kids turn out to have no incentives, I, think, I, don't, I don't think you should point at them. I think you pro should probably point at yourself. Charlie? Well, I don't think you can raise children in an affluent family and have them love working 60 hours a week in the hot sun digging fence post holes or something. That's not going to work. So. To some extent, you are destroying certain kinds of incentives. And uh, my advice to you is to uh, lose your fight as gracefully as you can. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can, if you're poor, if you can get your kids to love the idea of working 60 hours a week. <laughs> it, uh, they may have to, but... Uh, the kids no, that really get interested in something will work no matter how sure. rich they are. But it's rare to have an Ajit-like intensity of interest. You know, if you were a proctologist, you might not like your day as it went on and on. I think we better move along. <laughs> Becky? 